The reason I mention this is not, not to refute him, but to say as I'm listening to him talk, it occurred to me, wow. Get the out of Yeah. All right. Y'all heard that, right? The youngin wanted him to leave. The youngin in the crowd was yelling out, get the Frank out of, we say MST. I don't know a school that, where, wherever he was, he was, he was saying, get the F out of whatever. Funding on American public schools has escalated fantastically. It has gone up many, many times from what it was. And yet the schools never seem to improve. And yet, we never see people like Jesse Jackson protesting outside the public schools, even though black kids can't get a good education seemingly anywhere in the whole city or in the whole state. Now, why is that? Similarly, healthcare. People say healthcare costs keep rising. Why do healthcare costs keep rising? Healthcare costs keep rising for a really simple reason. The guy who's getting the benefit is not the guy who's paying. Now, <laughs> Wow, sheesh, this brother didn't, didn't smile. He didn't smirk. He didn't do anything to let you believe that, lead you to believe that um, he was joking. <laughs> the guy that's doing all of the paying is not receiving the benefits. The guy that's paying is the, the taxpayer. The people receiving the benefits are not the taxpayers, is what he's saying, I believe. Now, let, let me engage in a moment of speculative, progressive reasoning for a moment. We have a right, no less for health care, we have a right to eat. We have a right to food. Who would deny that the right to prevent ourselves from starvation is as basic a right as health care? All right, now let's have Obamacare as applied to food. You will now be allowed to go to the grocery store and order whatever you want. Fill up your cart, you don't have to pay. Somebody else will pay. What's going to happen? The first thing that will happen is You'll take all kinds of stuff that you don't need. You'll fill your cart, you'll buy 12 cartons of milk and 45 cartons of bologna. And then you go up to the counter and the grocery store will realize that they can charge whatever they want because you're not paying. So they will escalate their prices. The basic idea is that what's going on, you and the grocery store are conspiring to rip off the taxpayer. Wow. A third man is being cheated. And so what's going on with free education, free health care, is the taxpayer is being ripped off. Wow. That's now I would love to see I would love to see some actual information to back that up. Because that on paper, him first well, him first mentioning it and um and tying it together, it sounds like it could possibly make some sense, but leave far I need to I need to see how that ties together. How does he tie that together? Because um it seemed like um and I already know, man, his brother, um, Dinesh D'Souza, he is extremely intelligent. <laughs> oh, my gracious. <laughs> I don't know how in the world this dude is intelligent as hell. <laughs> to the point where he pissed, the old, um, he pissed the Obama administration off so much that they went ahead and locked this tail up, from what I'm hearing. <laughs> but I do want to hear how he ties that in because... Um, that seems extremely speculative and it's not and he obviously in this in that small clip there wasn't enough time um well they didn't include any um support of that statement that he made the couple of statements that he made about the consumer being in cahoots with the with the grocery store and the person that's paying the bill is the taxpayer i admitted it before he even went on to explain more i understood it but I would like to see what um, I would like to understand why that isn't speculative. Thousand, the hundreds, if not thousands, of bills passed by Republican officials since 2011 that have that have policed the woman's body and limited female access to contraceptives and to abortion. We talk about birth control and abortion. Let's set aside for one moment the debate about whether or not abortion is a constitutional right. I would submit that it is not. You can read the Constitution, squeeze lemon juice on it, hold it upside down, it's just not in there. But let's assume it was. Let's assume it was sort of invisibly there as part of the Bill of Rights. Right up there with free speech and right up there with the right to religion and the right to assembly and so on. Here's my question to you. Why should the abortion right be subsidized 
when none of our other fundamental rights are. Wow. I mean, you have a right to free speech. Does the government give you money to start a newspaper? You have a Second Amendment right to own a gun. Is the government going to buy you a, a, a shotgun? You have a right to free assembly. You've got to do it on your own time. You have a right to a free ex exercise of religion. The government's not going to pay for your churches. So since the government pays for none of our other fundamental rights, why does this right get to be in a category of itself? So let's imagine. Wow. Okay. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. And I would have loved to hear the young lady's um, answer. It makes perfect sense. You got all these rights. But now since this is something that you're choosing to be, you're, you're choosing to take part in or, or um, participate in as an adult with all these rights, you can also choose to find a way to pay for it or find a way to take care of it or, you know, this is, that's your job. You have the right. Now you have the job to get it done. However you get it done. Wow. Okay. That was, uh, that was pretty good, man. Imagine I'm walking on the, on the river bank or on the beach and I have a sandwich. I made it. It's my favorite bologna and cheese sandwich. And I'm walking around getting ready just to whip it out and uncork it and start eating it. When a guy comes up to me and he goes, hey man, I'm really hungry, give me half your sandwich. And so I do, I give him half a sandwich. Now, I would say that this is actually a very virtuous transaction. Why? Because first, I am a good guy, I shared my sandwich, I feel good about myself and rightly so. And the person who gets the sandwich is a recipient of a good deed and so they feel a sense of gratitude and a sense of obligation and maybe later if they have a sandwich they'll share with some other guy so it's an all-round you may say virtuous transaction but now i want to run the same transaction but run it through the government with slight modifications so let's follow the same transaction i'm walking on the beach i've got my sandwich i open it up i'm about to eat it hungry guy shows up and he goes i'm hungry give me half your sandwich now let's say that I answer no. Now in a sense, I'm not doing anything evil because it is my sandwich. It is mine to give. If he doesn't get it, he's no worse off than he was before. I'm not oppressing him. I'm merely not conferring a benefit on him. But nevertheless, I've said no. And now something interesting happens. I hear a galloping and here's Obama on a white horse. He shows up. He dismounts and he puts a gun to my head and he goes, hand that man half your sandwich. And so I do. Why Obama though? <laughs> why Obama? It's, why, why did he say Obama on the white horse? I'm guessing uh, this probably happened during the um, President Obama administration. Is that what happened? So, um, Forcing someone to, forcing a taxpayer again to do something with his money that he does not feel like, he, he feel like he has the right to decide not to do it or to do it. And the person that, that wants more rights, these rights are not, not anything that says um, the law has to do what you want them to do, but I'm going to change this and force those who um who are trying to get around this to take care of you is he talking about obamacare is he talking about education free education okay okay I'll, I'll, let me just follow along and so the outcome is the same as in my earlier example the other guy ends up at half a sandwich but now let's follow the actual transaction first of all i am a reluctant giver i was not going to give him the sandwich I'm forced, I have a gun to my head. It's, it's no virtue to me because I'd rather give up the sandwich than have my brains blown out. So I just chose the lesser evil. I deserve no credit. The guy who gets the sandwich, far from feeling appreciative, he feels entitled. Oh crap, only half a sandwich, where's the other half, man? I'm really hungry. In other words, he's entitled. And so what I'm getting at is the same transaction that would be a beautiful and virtuous transaction, if it were voluntary and in the private sector, becomes a monstrous transaction 
In fact, if you look at this transaction of the, the horseman dismounting and putting a gun to my head, if someone tried that in the private sector, they would be considered an outlaw and sent to prison. No, don't shout at me. I'm defending fascism. No, I'm exposing you as a fascist. Because, oh. because. This dude brings the heat, don't he? The lady said, you're talking about fascists. He said, no, I'm not exposing fascists. I'm calling you, you, specifically you, <laughs> you. You want smoke? Hey, I'm a chimney. Let's go. Do you realize, uh, I'm, I'll tell you how. You asked me a question. Hold on. Are you familiar? Are you familiar with the black shirts in Italy or the brown shirts in Germany? Do you realize that they would go to campuses, goons, and would stand in the back of the room, and when somebody tried to make an intelligent presentation and answer questions, they would shout them down, yell at them, try to intimidate them, and count as success if they could get the event canceled and the speaker threatened. But see, the problem is, sometimes you get speakers like me who are not scared of people like you. We recognize your frauds. <laughs> I recognize, I recognize that ultimately you are afraid of ideas. You're not willing to engage with me. Yes, you're afraid of ideas. You're not afraid of fascists. You think I pose a threat to you? I'm an immigrant. I came to America with nothing. What threat do I pose to you? Now, if we're saying that it's... I love that. I love that. This brother said, I am an immigrant. I came to this country with nothing. What threat do I pose to you? Whew, that was nice. If you don't sit your butt down some daggone way yelling at me while I'm trying to do my presentation before I embarrass you some more, relax. You, you, you. I will say your parents did an excellent job at empowering you and letting you know that your voice, um, your voice is worthy of being heard, and that you are, you, you are powerful, and that you should have confidence and believe in yourself, and, and, and not be afraid to do this you just made a bad decision you the decision you made was to do all of that foolishness and um um for the wrong cause and in front of the wrong crowd to the wrong speaker now i gotta set you down you know what i mean you're not gonna win every fight it's okay baby girl it's okay absolutely impossible to give that money back because it's too hard to trace we'd have to uh give money to the african tribes we'd have to give money to people who are no longer exist that's absolutely fine but we have to understand that we haven't really come to terms with that injustice that's been perpetrated and if we are admitting that no one um that no one is perfectly entitled to absolutely everything that their uh, ancestors were, uh, had stolen from them, then we also have to accept that there are people today who benefit from the fact that their parents and grandparents profited from this immoral system. And, and the way to deal with that is with the social safety net that enables everyone to thrive. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you there. Now, the first thing I'm trying to say is, this is a hugely controversial principle because it actually involves wrecking the freedom of a free society. You basically have to, to put it frankly, if we were to carry that out, go into people's homes and take their stuff, take their furniture, take their cars. You don't seem to have even the guts to do that. You don't have the moral self-confidence to do it yourself. It may be, if I am advocating a rule of social justice and I'm advocating it for the whole society, before I persuade everybody else, let's say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian and I believe everybody should give 10% of their wealth to help the poor. And I go, you know what? There, the Bible says this, the Bible says that everybody should give 10% of their wealth to help the poor. And somebody says, Dinesh, are you giving 10% of your wealth? And I'm like, actually no, but I did do some tutoring. And you go, wait a minute, aren't you advocating? Aren't you saying that there is a moral duty to do this? Why don't you do it? That I'm saying that the Southern... Yep, and that's because, and I said this in one of my other videos, that's because people believe that the government is not a function of um, society that they should participate in um, directly. They should, they should deal with them indirectly. We vote them in, they handle everything. We complain, you go take care of it. We complain, you go take care of it. We need something, you go get it. We want something, you go get it. Who's going to pay for it? 
That's not our problem. I can care less who pay for it. I just know that it's your job to govern this country, this nation. That's how a lot of people look at it, man. They don't really consider everything that goes into it. Because as soon as you ask the question, who's going to pay for this? Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that. Who's going to do this? Nobody wants to hear that. Give black people reparations. Give black people their money back. Like, okay. You ready to give and give her and give up your money and, and make sure that all your friends and relatives give up their money? Oh no, nah, we ain't that what we pay taxes for? Use that. See you all you always asking how we gonna pay for this. The government gonna take care of it. Now give them their money. <laughs> and 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 the conversations just get more and more and more ridiculous. Shout out to your young man. He sounds very um, professional. I, I, I like um, the fact that he he presented himself so well, but no, young man. Saying that there is a moral duty to do this, why don't you do it? That I'm saying that the Southern economy was essentially a non-capitalist economy. Its champions knew that. The defenders of slavery all attacked capitalism. But they it, hated was, it was in the it was in the pursuit of profit, which has continued on since then through the Jim Crow law errors, since the establishment of private prisons. Um, and it's you know it's happening to this day. It's, it's Look, it hasn't changed. It's, Look, it's it's been capitalism since this country has been founded, and that capitalism is rooted in the slavery of this country. The dictator, look, the dictator of Venezuela, Maduro, right? When he yeah. died, he was a billionaire, so he was obviously in pursuit of profit. He was a socialist who was looting the country for himself. Was he a capitalist because he cared about profit? No, because capitalism is not just about caring about profit, capitalism is about a certain way of going about business that actually mutually enriches all the parties involved. Otherwise, they don't do the transaction. If I go to apply for a job at a company, and let's just say they offer to pay me $1 an hour, right? And let's just say, that you, I say, that's scandalous, that's slavery wages. If I don't take the job, I'm no worse off than I was before. They haven't exploited me in any way. They're offering me a deal, I'm free to take it or not. It's completely different if they go grab me, put a chain around my neck and make me work. That's the opposite of capitalism. That's why, read Lincoln. Lincoln says slavery is you work, I eat. And the alternative for him is the hand that makes the corn gets to put the corn in its own mouth. For Lincoln, that's capitalism. The Scandinavian... Nice breakdown, sir. Nice breakdown. Model is really simple. Everyone benefits and everyone has to pay. In other words, this is not a soak the rich scheme. The highest tax rates in Scandinavia, 60, 70, and 80% kick in on the middle class. If you make $50,000 in Scandinavian countries, you're in the 50% tax bracket. Not only are you at that rate, there's a 25% VAT tax on everything you buy, which is a regressive tax that hits the poor more than it hits the rich. The Scandinavians are into soaking the poor, and they don't make any bones about it. Their point is, if you want this package of benefits, we have the right to take half your stuff. Now, co contrast this with the deceitful way in which people like AOC and Elizabeth, we're not going to go after, they don't even have the guts to say they're gonna go after the upper middle class. They go, we're gonna go after the billionaires. There are 300 billionaires in America. We're gonna go after the billionaires. So in other words, what you have in, in American, well, Scandinavian socialism is, I call it unification socialism. Let's, everybody's in the same boat. American socialism is division socialism. Let's take society, divide it as many ways we can, intensify hatred, toward the group that is being demonized. So intensify hatred, for example, of the black against the white, the illegal against the legal, the, the, the poor against the rich, the gay against the straight. And so what you get is this thing that's now called intersectionality, which I guess is a marriage of all these different types of divisions. I wanna suggest that is the very and exact opposite of what they do in Scandinavia. They don't do that. Now, very interestingly, there is one place in the world where all these features of American socialism are in fact present. And that country is indeed Venezuela. Soviet Union, why did Hitler... And that's why the young man had on that hat that says, make Venezuela 
great again. <laughs> and that country is indeed is Venezuela. Soviet Union. Why did Hitler consider Stalin his greatest enemy and consider that Lebensraum to the east was the way to go and killed 80 percent of uh, sent 80 percent of his soldiers to fight the Soviets if they were basically the same uh, ideology? Very good question. Which is, if Nazism and, and, and communism are both leftist, how come do they how come they went to war? First of all, it's important to realize that ideologies that are very close to each other frequently do go to war. The Catholics and the Protestants, the Shia and the Sunni. The Shia and the Sunni are both in the House of Islam. They actually agree on 99% of theological beliefs. But they How is he always so quick with his answers in the, and then he goes and give you an example that's like perfect. He would give you like the, the way he just now decide, um, the, described the two um, religious beliefs, the two denominations of religion. And he, dis, and he just, they're right here. They just have one or two beliefs that's different that make them what they are. And he said, they went at it. Then he pointed at someone else. They went at it. They went at it. They went at it. So you can't use the fallacy to, um, to make me believe that what you're saying mean that they weren't friends. Or, or that they weren't close um, or, or try to act like the other side was for the Nazis and one side was for Stalin. I think he said Stalin. Yeah, both in the House of Islam. They actually agree on 99% of theological beliefs, but yeah. they've been fighting for centuries. Why? Competitions over territory and power and so on. Remember that Hitler was a national Hitler. socialist. The reason that Hitler hated the communists was not because they were socialists. He liked that part about it. What he didn't like is that they were taking their orders from Moscow. He saw them as traitors to Germany. So Hitler's priority was socialism in Germany. Now remember that Hitler who went to war with Stalin was allied with Stalin. So on the foreign policy domain, Hitler was perfectly happy to sign the Hitler-Stalin pact and then violate it for reasons of national interest. So the bottom line of it is the fact that Germany and, and the Soviet Union went to war in no way refutes the idea that progressivism, communism, and fascism were all three sister movements that developed in Germany, this in Italy, so in America, and crazy. in Russia, all in response to the crisis He's of smart Marxism. As hell, man. The He's reason smart I mention this is not, not to refute him, but to say as I'm listening to him talk, it occurred to me, wow. He's a guy. Yeah. yeah. All right. See, this is the acceptable bigotry of the left. This is the acceptable bigotry of the left in which... <laughs> you, have this, you have this lousy beneficiary of white privilege. <laughs> right? <laughs> He said this lousy beneficiary of white privilege. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, that was a good one, bro. That was a good one, D'Souza. Hey, man, that was a good one, bro. Right? Now, if... Now, if he knew, if he knew, if he knew an ounce of history, he would sit here, listen to me, and stand up and ask a question that will show me up. But he won't do that. He won't do that because he's a thug. He's a thug who wants to shout me down. That's all he knows how to do. Open debate is not racist. Open debate is very healthy in an academic community. Racial denigration is racist. So I ask you in fairness, I've been up here now speaking. Uh, if you believe the posters and the dissenters and the comments and the Stanford paper and so on, I. You might have expected me to stand up and give you 45 minutes of racial invective. So a very good way to test these things is to ask you, have you heard me say anything tonight that you would consider racist? And if not, why would you even raise that term in my connection? Um, so I will concede to you. Um, I did not hear anything explicitly racist. And I, I do have to say I appreciate that. Thank you. The bottom line of it is you don't get to jump. Why does why did she call him racist then? I mean, I didn't hear her call him racist, but that's what he was answering to. He was like, dude, come on. I clearly ain't saying I'm racist. Did you hear me say anything racist? So, why? <laughs> why are you calling me racist? I, I do have to say I appreciate that. Thank you. 
the bottom line of it is you <laughs> don't get to jump the line. That's lawlessness. And not only is it lawlessness, but those of us who come from countries far away, this jumping of the line hurts us more than it hurts anybody else. It hurts legal immigrants standing in line from a long distance away who can't jump a fence and can't swim the Rio Grande. It hurts us much more than it hurts native-born Americans because we, our lives are hanging by a thread and these jerks jump ahead of us and it doesn't matter that they're looking for a better life, we are too. The Second Amendment does not exist for hunting. Mm. It's not ultimately about the fact that some people like to go shoot deer and they need um, sports weapons to do that. The real purpose of the First Amendment is to protect the citizens from their own government, from the risk of government tyranny. <laughs> okay? That's why it's there. That's why it's there. Now, the progressives want to dominate the state and they want to have increasing state control over the lives of citizens. Having an armed citizenry is a major check on that. And I believe that ultimately that's what drives gun control. Because think about it. Uh, what gun control policy could have prevented Las Vegas? Even Dianne Feinstein said, I can't even think of any. Uh, number two, what purpose is served by taking guns away from law-abiding citizens if your point is actually to prevent non-law-abiding citizens from killing them. Remember Rahm Emanuel's never let a good crisis go to waste. So whenever there's some panic, they actually hope to ride the panic to pass a law that may even seem senseless three weeks later, but you did it in a panic. Um, and so um, the use of crisis is, by the way, the fascists were like experts at this. They used the Reichstag fire was what Hitler used to get the Enabling Act passed, which gave him essentially supreme power over Nazi Germany. He didn't have it before that. The parliament gave it to him. And he used a, uh, some say a manufactured crisis, that's debated by scholars, but nevertheless a crisis in order to claim that power. Now, gun control. Gun control is one of those things that I'm just now getting more information about. Well, obviously I'm getting information about a lot of things, son. But I do have a question about that. Protecting the Second Amendment, right? And I see that conservatives are real big on that, protecting the Second Amendment. And the more I learn about it, the more, um, the more I understand why. I get it, um, but I have a question for you. When someone goes to the store and they purchase one gun, two gun, three guns, um, they, pour, they purchase um, military helmets, military vests, military this, military that, at what point are they, um, are they watched? At what point? Do they receive some type of, okay, we need to make sure they're everything okay over there because this person is person a whole lot of sugar, honey, iced tea. And I ask that because, you know, the situation that just now happened in Buffalo, uh, Buffalo, New York, knucklehead as young and that was from New York. I think he was from New York too, just not Buffalo, um, drove three hours to, um, to shoot up um, a grocery store. And apparently this same young man threatened to um, shoot up his school during graduation that got swept under the rug. Then he wrote a manifesto, um, a long paper talking about why he believed what he believed and what he was planning on doing. And that was online for a while. Um, now, also considering that he's 18 years old and he purchased all these things himself. Um, this was nobody else's weapons that he purchased. So at what point does a red flag is um, get raised to prevent certain things like that? Now, I know y'all saying there's no way to prevent that. That was going to happen. He's He was raised wrong. He was evil. He was all these things. And y'all would be correct on all of it. He was raised wrong. He was evil. And anything else you can think of. Absolutely. But... He was of sound mind enough to write that daggone long letter to go to the store and purchase all them weapons. And then they found out that he was inside the grocery store a few times casing out what he was going to do. So he took that trip a few times to case out that daggone grocery store and was approached by the security guard a couple of times when he was up in there 
um, just in there taking notes, taking pictures, those type of things. At what point is um, law-abiding citizens who are following certain patterns um, watched just in case some sugar honey iced tea pops off? Now, I know you guys have the answers to that. That's some FBI type stuff. They probably do watch. But they just wasn't watching him. And out of all the seven point whatever billion people in the world, I mean, you're not going to be able to watch everybody at the same time. I get that, too. I get that, too. All I'm saying is sometimes we need to consider that if something is done, it could prevent innocent people from dying. Just like if more people had guns in New York. And But you got to consider, too, the people that the young man shot were mostly senior citizens. And I get it. Senior citizens walk around with guns, too, not old grandmas. Like, he shot old grandmas. That was nuts. So, yeah, that's that's something to consider, guys. Tax rate crisis, that's debated by scholars, but nevertheless a crisis in order to claim that power. My question for you is more based on discourse. Um, in a climate right now with what's going on outside and what can happen in here, the word bigot being thrown around, um, how do we maintain a level of intellectual discourse that keeps conversation happening instead of not happening? This use of the word bigot, uh, you got to be very careful because when I was here at Dartmouth, I was, I was a freshman here in the aftermath of what's called the Berkeley free speech movement. And it was all these guys who were like, free speech, free speech, free speech. And we supported them. Our newspaper on campus was partly modeled on the Berkeley barb that was behind this kind of activism. It's only later I realized that when those guys take control, they will immediately start suppressing the speech of others. In other words, they don't actually believe in free speech. They believe in free speech for them. Bigot is a very loaded term. And because it has real sting and applies to real people, there's an effort to try to pin it on people. <clears throat> See, like these guys are walking out, they're too lazy to debate with me. Not they're not going to. I mean, they aren't. They aren't. Because I remember this right here. I remember this because um, because then the then the girl was like, "See, you're you're being mean again. You didn't have to call them lazy. You didn't have to call them names." <laughs> That's because people feel so deeply about things where they're not really understanding that their way of doing this right here, whatever they're doing, this walk through, this walk out, this interruption, this protest, silent protest, whatever they're doing right now, is not going to help anything. It's not, it's not constructive, and we could have been, it, it would have been far better off had they raised their hands and addressed me person to person so I can go ahead and I can speak directly to whatever their, um, their issue is. If they got an issue with me, we could speak about that. But what they decided to do was just interrupt discourse that was happening. They interrupted discourse. You say, how can we have um, some discourse um that can lead to something better yeah we're doing it right now them they're messing it up they're messing it up they're taking our attention away from whatever we're whatever positivity is coming from this back and forth that you and i are having i'm here I, i'm here institution and the standards that this institution upholds for you to say that they're lazy is kind of see a bit I'm not saying that they're lazy people I'm, I'm simply saying that they are not willing to do the intellectual work to stand up face to face with me look if I said those things on those posters and if I believe them and if they're all true this is a slam dunk against me. All someone has to do is stand up here quote my own words back to me in the complete confidence that I would have no rebuttal right and crush me and i'm saying they can't do that and they're not going to or, or if they will i'm i'm actually anticipating that and waiting for it but it hasn't happened yet so i'm just saying that the enemy of free speech is not me the enemy of free speech are the people who would rather have that i never came that they never would have to have that kind of debate that they would win this confrontation by default real talk 
Those are the enemies of free speech, the ones that are trying to prevent people from speaking. <laughs> because then my speech, my speech isn't free anymore. It's not free. I thought it was, but apparently you're showing me that it's not. That was good. Um, Dinesh D'Souza is, whew, the dude is, is, is crazy smart. I know I asked a couple of questions within the, the whole video. Um, I forget all the questions I asked. <laughs> But if you remember them, if you want my answer, answering them and let me know whatever it is you want me to know in the comments below and, um, and maybe hitting that subscribe button on your way out the door. Once again, guys, I'm Van and now we are all the LFR family and I look forward to seeing you on the next video and hopefully inside the Patreon as well. Y'all are dope, man. Thank you for everything. I appreciate you clicking play. All right. Love y'all.